And then when, I, when I'm tired of doing that and I, and I think, okay, I'm going to be done, I set it aside in the corner and wait another few more days just to let it soak in there. And every once in a while, taking a wooden spoon and lifting the fiber up out of the water to check the color. And in the beginning, when you took, you, the water is beautiful. It's got wonderful color in it. But you pick up the wool, and the wool just bleaches right out to white. And then so eventually, you get the color in the wool that you're pleased with. And you say, OK, I'm done. Then you rinse it, and then you set it, set it aside to dry, as similar to the way you did the dishes. Mm -hmm. Now, I forgot to mention, uh, you need a mordant when you are dying with, with uh, plants. And a mordant is a chemical reaction that helps the wool, the scales in the wool, she was mentioning scales, those scales lift up and open up so that the fiber will accept the color better. And in most cases, I use alum and cream of tartar as my mordants. Alum, as some people have used to make pickles, and cream of tartar as we use in baking. So they're very safe mordants to use. Um, historically, some of the mordants that were used were things like chrome and tin and iron. And these have been shown, to, in some cases, chrome particularly, to be cancer producing. So those are no longer considered safe mordants to use and are not used as, as a general rule. Also, disposal, disposal of your metal mordants has to be taken into account. You don't want to dump that water any place where it might get into your well system or go downstream to your neighbor's house and contaminate their well. So we have to be careful of this, about these things and be knowledgeable about that. Did that answer the question about plant dyeing? Did <laughs> you use grass? Can you can use grass. You can use grass, but it makes a very, very pale green. It's not something I've done, but I have a book. I brought a book somewhere. Where is the original book? That he has here. A dyer's garden. And it, it, I'd be happy to pass this around and look up, look up things that you might be interested in dying with. This is the marigolds page. Some of them are marked because it's something I use. And the, it, the colors down the side tell you what different colors you get depending on the type of fiber. You get a different color if you're using cotton fiber than if you use wool fiber or linen, for example. So I'd be happy to pass that around in case anybody wants to take a quick peek. So we have our colored uh, wool. And then the next thing that we need to do is to card the wool, which is kind of like brushing it. And um, I've just taken some of this wool that I picked apart a little bit, and the hand card, oh, I've got a little purple in here. So the card is kind of like a wire dog brush, and they have a little catch turn on the edge. And children, actually, by the time they're five or six years old, would learn to do the hand carding uh, many years ago. That was their job. And they would have to take all of the fiber, pull it apart, and card it. Right there. And after they've gotten it all lifted off from one hand card, they switch over and do it again. So while Mother was spinning, Well, okay, let's talk about many years ago first. Uh, many years ago when the carding was done by hand or uh, here in Maine, there were many carding mills. So that the process would be shearing the sheep, dyeing the wool, sending it off to the carding mill. And in a village, m most villages had a village spinner uh, or a spinster. Women who were not married needed to have a way to make a living, and this was one of the common ways that they made a living. And a woman who was a spinner would go from house to house in those places who could afford to pay someone to do that. Um, and they would, they would be there for as long as it took to spin that wool into yarn. So it would come back from the carding mill, and then the spinster or the, the woman of the house 
would fit into a uh, single ply wool, and then it would be woven on the loom, and then it would be sewn into a garment such as the dress that I have on. So is it any wonder that people had to get along with very few sets of clothes? Mm -hmm. when, when children who outgrew their one set of clothes would then, um, that would get passed down to the next one in line, the next smaller child. I have here um, an example of a hook rug. This is one that my grandmother did. I'm very proud that I treasure it very much. My grandmother Thurston, who lived in Danville, did this beautiful hook rug. This um, makes me think about the fact that when clothing was worn out, it was always put to good use. So probably some of the wool in a rug of this kind was taken from the parts of the garment that were the least worn and made into yet another useful item, which in this case would be a hook rug. Um, now, in some cases, the wool would be dyed. Say it was a light colored wool. and you wanted to have a rose pattern or a border like that, it could be dyed. And my grandmother used cushion dye from some little packages like this, um, which is way easier than the plant method. <laughs> you just dissolve a little bit of this powder in the hot water and add some vinegar to set the wool, and you get instant color. It's great fun. <laughs> <laughs> I spent the morning using the little powders to dye with. It, it, it is great fun. So I'm, I actually think I remember, although I was quite young when my grandmother died, I think I remember her using the little package, packages of dye and creating the dyes that she used to dye pieces of wool for making her hook rug uh, on the wood stove. And we have a wood stove, and I do it still to this day. <laughs> Any questions at this point? Yes? You just got the spinning wheel. Oh, well, we haven't gotten that yet, have we? We've gotten the wool carded. Now, uh, when we carded with the cards like this, you take the wool off, and you have what is called a roll log. And the roll log is then ready to spin. So it would be pre-drafted, which is pulling it out like this. <coughs> and you can see that that will be ready to spin. And I may just actually spin that in a little bit. Nowadays, when we send the wool off to be carded, it comes back to us in a long tube like this, which is called roving. And I'm going to show you how to spin with that. Now, the spinning wheel has a lever here. There are some that have two, so we double foot spinning. I take off my shoe because I like to be able to feel the pedal under my foot. As I turn the pedal, um, when you're learning to spin, the first thing you have to learn to do is to control the wheel and get it to go either <coughs> clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, does it matter? Yes, it does matter because uh, when you are spinning it into wool, in, into yarn, you go clockwise. When you ply two pieces together, you go counterclockwise or else you'd just be unspinning what you already spun. <laughs> so if I started out and spun that way for a while, and then I switched and spun the other way for a while, it would just unspin what I had already spun up. So uh, this cord then um, causes this to spin, and as that spins, it causes the wool to turn. So let's see how we do it. So I pinch, pull, let go. Pinch, pull, If it breaks, you just stop and overlap it a little bit and keep going. Whoop, going the wrong way. In fact, that was one of the reasons that it took me so long to figure out how to do this. 